Ah, yes, people can hear. So, colleagues, good, good morning. I'm George Duggins, leader of Common City Council. Izzy, uh, second moves leader of Warwickshire, will follow, and then there'll be a, a variety of eminent speakers uh, to take us through this, this morning. Um, I shall be here till around about 12, and uh, I know others will be popping in and out during the day. So, welcome, and thank you very much for, for coming. And I suppose our everyday lives are still heavily dependent upon the excessive use of fossil fuels. Sustainability and climate change is the greatest challenge to ever face mankind. Uh, and there are no easy solutions. But mankind needs to come together, uh, you know, to effectively meet this huge challenge. In recent years, local authorities across the country have declared climate change emergencies and set themselves the most ambitious targets uh, many to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030, 20 years ahead of that set by the UK government, often, if we're frank, with little clue as to how they're going to achieve that goal. Coventry recognised the importance of the issue long ago. Then in the 1990s, we were very active with promoting Local Agenda 21, and as concerns about climate change grew, Comte was a founding signatory of the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Emergency back in 2008. It drafted its first climate change strategy in 2012, one of the first cities to do so, achieving its target of a 27.5% reduction in CO2 levels by 2020, uh, and the Council activities uh, enabled us to achieve that. Uh, six years ahead of, of target. We're members of the National Placed Climate Action Network, 17 leading authorities chaired by Professor Andy Goulson at Leeds University. Professor Goulson was involved in the development of the UK's Stern Review, which highlighted the economic consequences of climate change and how it will adversely affect the economy and the cost to our environmental support systems and society generally. Recently, we commissioned Andy Goulson's team to develop a zero carbon road route map for the city to help inform the development of the new council strategy for sustainability and climate change. If Coventry continues to use energy as it has, it will only be 10 more years uh, in which we uh, reach the uh, tipping points of temperature rise over 1.5 degrees centigrade. This is typical of cities across the country, so one can see the scale of the challenge that we face, which is immense. An increase above 1.5 will melt the Earth's permafrost, releasing methane, a greenhouse gas which stores 28% times more heat than carbon dioxide. The world's natural negative biofeedback mechanisms will become overloaded. Their failure will increase the risk of catastrophic climate uh, effects. To put the challenge before us in perspective, the City Council is only responsible for about 1% of all carbon emissions in the city. So if we are going to have a major impact on addressing the city's contribution to climate change, we have to work in partnership with major stakeholders to effect lasting change. We invited Margot James, and we're very thankful uh, for Margot, uh, the former government minister for digital, culture, media and sport, and now executive chair of Warwickshire Manufacturing Group here at the University of Warwick to help bring together and chair an independent climate board of which my colleague, Councillor Jim O'Ball, is Vice Chair. Professor Goldson gave a presentation at the Climate Board's last meeting highlighting the likely scale of challenge and we are looking forward to receiving the zero carbon route map which will identify the likely cost and carbon reduction benefits for a whole host of possible interventions across the city. 
the conflict in Ukraine and recent announcements of boycotts of oil and gas purchases from Russia has highlighted the importance of our needing to move to renewable energy sources sooner rather than later. As a local authority, we have created successful partnerships with industry in addressing issues such as district heating and the management of waste. We are now looking at how we address the issues of creating a zero carbon energy infrastructure to meet the needs of new developments and industry, as well as helping to reduce costs for residents across the city. Rising fuel prices are going to hit those in fuel poverty very hard, and we have been successful in bidding in every round of the government's at LADS and social housing decarbonisation funds. We as an authority also invested providing support for those in fuel poverty. Yet, of course, the government will need to do more. Around 30% of our emissions come from households, and in the last year we have invested 6.5 million, which will improve the energy efficiency of some in the region of 650 households. Yet we know that approximately 13,000 households are in fuel poverty, so the scale of investment is a major challenge. Commentary sees addressing these issues as a major opportunity for growing our local economy and creating jobs for the city. So as you will hear later today, my colleague, Councillor O'Boyle, uh, will outline with our sustainability and climate change team uh, what we'll, we will be doing. There are a number of issues here, colleagues. Zero carbon development of renewable energy infrastructure, circular economy, minimising waste, extending the lifespan of products, recycling and encouraging reuse, biodiversity increasing wildlife in the city and access to open spaces, tackling inequalities, addressing fuel poverty, food poverty and air quality and health, adoption of resilience, minimising the impact of extreme climate events, flooding and heat waves. Once we have completed our draft strategy we, and the Climate board, Change Board will be engaging with the city, citizens of Coventry in this debate. Behavioural change and local action will be the key to our future success. The natural environment does not recognise local authority boundaries and what we do in one area will affect uh, people in other areas as well. This meeting is vitally important for us to learn from each other, share common interests to see where we can take our collective action and address the issues, whether it's sharing resources or lobbying government for change. The recent National Audit Office report commissioned by the Government's Climate Change Committee highlighted the fact that while central government recognises the importance of local government in addressing the challenge of climate change, it has not yet provided the framework and resources to enable us to realise the potential that we have. We all hope that today will help us share our experiences to start a collaborative process for addressing those cross-boundary issues which affect us all and our ability to create a zero carbon future. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. And, and I have to say a big thank you to all of you for coming here today for what I think is a really important starting event for us as the public sector um, in our various guises, our business sector as well, in thinking about how we work together um, and how we talk about what's such an important discussion. Um, and I have to say, it comes at a time which is really difficult. Uh, I think on the back of the last two years, every single one of us thought that was the crisis of our century, and that was going to be the most difficult thing that we would all have faced, a global pandemic which has uh, destroyed many people's lives. Uh, we've lost residents 
and we've got families who are having to live with the consequences. We've got mental health concerns. We've got services that have been challenged uh, in how they change and adapt to delivering through that. Um, and I have to say a huge thank you to every single one of our own staff. And I, 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 George, I take the liberty of that on behalf of you as well. Um, they have been magnificent. Uh, and, and barely have we got to talking about normality mm. than we suddenly face the crisis of another century, which, um, oh dear, sorry, telephones. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's really important to reflect at this point in time that the appalling situation in Ukraine, which is at the forefront of our minds at the moment, and I don't think any one of us uh, won't, will be um, not affected by this situation when we see the uh, television and the pictures on our newspapers coming through. And we all, our thoughts and our prayers are with the people of Ukraine. We wish for an, a swift end to conflict, whether we will in reality be able to see that. We want the pain and the suffering to end, and we want normality, a, a new word that we're going to be using an awful lot to start to come back. But we can start to see the impact that that conflict will have on us here for many years to come. So um, across the Coventry and Warwickshire footprint, uh, which I'm sure you will hear much of today, uh, our economy environment, and George has touched on it, has been such a key and important part. We are business friendly. We value our businesses. We want to support jobs, skills, and we want to grow this sector, this area. Um, we need to be thinking today about the COVID crisis. We need to be thinking about the Ukrainian war. And more importantly, we need to be thinking about climate change and how this is impacting. So uh, I'm, I'm, I am going to reduce down what I was going to say, because George has said it, all the best uh, ideas uh, are shared ideas. And that's what today is about. This is a chance to network, to have those conversations that we've all individually been having, and to start to form a way forward together across the public sector. Uh, you know, we, what is our ambition across this area, and how can we shape that together and perhaps drive it forward a little faster? Uh, we build it on the back of the IPCC 6 assessment report uh, and the latest warning about the consequence of inaction, the report which describes a rapidly closing window to secure livable future. It talks about people and ecosystems and those who are least able to cope will be the hardest hit by this. We know that no action is not an option and we have to do this on the back of an increasing um, energy crisis uh, looking at a mixed bag of options for the future and understanding how we can give security and confidence to our residents about the future but but also to embed in them the seed of change which we cannot do this individually or on our own. We are not an island. We have to look at change together. So I'm asking this to be the catalyst for that together we take the, f the future forward of climate change in this sub-regional area. Last November, the COP26 in Glasgow provided outcomes that we um, can build on, I, I believe, and almost 200 countries uh, agreed the Glasgow Climate Pact, uh, which keeps alive the hope of limiting the rise in global temperature to 1.5 degrees, and combined with increased ambition and action from countries, 1.5 remains in sight. And it is hard, but we do need to keep that focus in mind. It will only be achieved if every country delivers on what they have pledged and a drive for action on mitigation, adaptation, finance and collaboration. 
and talking about every country and coming together at this time when, after 80 years of peace in Europe, we're seeing what's happening, feels a difficult conversation. But it is a conversation we have to keep having, and I believe that we will, despite all the uh, attempts not to. So it's really important, because if we're going to leave a legacy for my children and the children beyond, and we have with us today members of the Youth Parliament uh, and young people, this is something that we have to have that conversation about, because seldom do we ask our children what they want us to give them. But I think this is one of those asks that we should be saying today. So um, I'm going to wind up a little bit. We were a little late in starting. Can I encourage you in the breaks to have those conversations, find out who people are, um, open up conversations about what, what you're all doing, um, and network and make contacts for the future. Uh, I have a, a couple of housekeeping points, which I probably should have started with. I am being reminded about that. Um, firstly, if anyone today would like to have a lapel mic, you need to go to the back and, uh, and, and log that, and we will get that sorted. Um, we need to also set, that there's the usual things. This is a paperless event, of course. It, why, why wouldn't it be, says she, reading paper. But it is technically a paperless event. Um, I think we have to be aware that we are on the back of COVID, so please be as cautious as you can and respect people's views about how they would want to be approached and whether face masks are the thing of today or not. Absolutely understand that. Um, hand sanitizers available. You've got it on your table. And in the event of a fire, I've got my colleagues from Warwickshire Fire here. In the event of a fire, a meeting point is in the car park outside Radcliffe buildings. Um, the ex exits are clearly marked, I think you can see. Um, and you might see our photographer, Dennis, going around. Here he is. <laughs> so please do um, be there. We want to try and capture this event with as many mug shots of us all as we possibly can. So it looks exciting it looks engaging and it looks fun so and and remember to smile it's always a good thing um and we are going to be live streaming this event as well so uh we will be um, putting those on the websites after this uh the breakout sessions some of them will be here some of them will be in radcliffe house so just allow yourself um, enough time to get between one and the other and finally we will be tweeting throughout the event. And if you would like to join us with the virtual conversation, you can follow uh, at Warwickshire underscore CC and tweet on the hashtag CW Climate Change. I think I've done it, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you all very much for what you're going to be contributing to, not only today, but the future of this area in how we work together to improve and try to help the uh, climate change agenda in this area. Thank you all very much. And <laughs> invariably, I forgot one thing. And uh, we are really fortunate that um, uh, George has mentioned Margot James, who is the chair of the Coventry Climate Change Board and executive chair of WMG. Um, she hasn't been able to actually join us today, but we have got two video contributions. The first one will be from the mayor of the West Midlands, Andy Streets, who again wanted to be with us, but has not been able to manage diary commitments. Uh, so we will first of all have Andy um, contributing towards us, and then we will go straight through to Margot James' contribution as well. So without further ado, I will leave someone to play the video. Thank you. Hi there, Andy Street, Mayor of the West Midlands here, and I'm delighted to be able to say a few words of introduction at the beginning of your climate change conference today. Now, just a few months ago, leaders like myself were up in COP in Glasgow, and one of the things we were saying 
was that it's the responsibilities of cities and regions like ours to really step forward and deliver. And you know what? That's exactly what we're doing. Whether it be in transport, with the wonderful news about the all-electric bus city in Coventry, whether it be in the whole question of domestic use of energy, what we're beginning to do in retrofitting relatively small numbers of homes now, but it will grow, or of course in industry and all the work about the electrification of our automotive industry, centred right here, so important to our efforts. But the underlying thing is of course none of this can be achieved without brilliant collaboration between the public sector, the different parts of the public sector, and of course with private business. So when I look at the guests this day, I think you are actually doing today exactly what lies behind our future success. So all power to you for today. What I hope will come out today is lots of ideas and also the case to government. What further powers do we need? What funding do we need? How do we get across the idea that this place really is on the cutting edge of innovation that will not just address the climate change crisis, but will also give us some real success economically in years to come. Have a great day. Good morning, and welcome to the Slate at Warwick for this important conference on Coventry and Warwickshire's response to the climate crisis. My name is Margot James, I'm Chair of WMG at the University of Warwick and I'd like to start by thanking the seven councils who've brought us together to develop a concerted plan to reduce our carbon emissions to zero over the next 30 years. It's wonderful to see such a partnership being created across all of Coventry and Warwickshire because if there's one issue we all face together it's the threat of climate change. We may come from different backgrounds, have different perspectives and experiences, but we are united in recognising the need to reach net zero, protect our environment and build a sustainable model for the economic growth of our communities. Last year, Coventry City Council asked me to chair Coventry's Climate Change Board, and on the board are businesses like E.ON, Sargentsons, Coventry Building Society and the Police, Fire Service and the Hospital Trust, charities like the Wildlife Trust and the Canals and Rivers Trust, the LEP, the Chamber of Commerce and of course our two universities. We're working together with the Council to develop a plan to reduce emissions, monitor our progress and identify opportunities for sustainable growth. And we've done this because we recognise that preventing climate change is a responsibility for all of us and we will only be successful if everyone is successful working together. After all, we might identify carbon emissions at car tailpipes or factory chimneys, but those emissions are created by the ignition switches and dials each of us turn every day. We have to help people across all of society turn those dials less, reduce their need to press the switches and ensure when they do, it doesn't result in carbon emissions. That's why it's vital to work alongside the seven councils we're going to hear from. We'll be discussing the whole spectrum of what we can do to address the climate crisis and act more sustainably. Working together to increase recycling and reuse, improve the energy efficiency of homes and workplaces, green our energy supply, build up our biodiversity and resilience and create sustainable travel networks. It's a huge programme of work and only through partnership can we make progress because the climate does not recognise political boundaries. The choices we make will impact all of us. What's more, our wildlife, electric grids, transport networks are all interconnected, meaning that by working together, we can help each other make faster progress towards that more sustainable future. It's also important to remember that this is not just a challenge, that it's a historic opportunity here for our region. Our region grew to global industrial prominence thanks to innovation, creativity and skills, much of which were in the transport and engineering industries. Today we're taking that heritage and applying it to the challenge of net zero. If we work together, we can make Coventry and Warwickshire the home of green innovation. At WMG and Warwick University, we're working to seize that opportunity, creating an electric vehicle innovation cluster 
with the Energy Innovation Centre here at Warwick and the UK Battery Industrialisation Centre down at Baggington. We're developing green public transport systems through the Very Light Rail project with City Council and we're also helping companies like Pashley in Stratford produce electric cargo trikes for last mile deliveries. I could name many more, such as the work we're doing to extract hydrogen from wastewater with Seven Trent or the Regional Energy System project with infrastructure and power companies. Each of these projects is a partnership, and I'm sure that all of you are involved in similar partnerships, whether it's rugby, bringing together the community there um, for the Rugby Climate Summit, or Warwickshire County Council's work to decarbonise buildings. At this event, all of us are coming together to share the experience, the expertise and the knowledge because none of us individually can do all that needs to be done. But together we can move faster, further and smarter. We can make the journey to net zero a reality. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, that it's really exciting to hear some of the stuff that is going on individually within our areas, and this is about what today is about sharing it. Um, we have got, as promised, uh, our next two speakers, Alice and Zoe, who are going... Who, the, these are our youth parliament in Warwickshire, youth council, and, and it's really important that we do hear their voice, because I know that climate change is one of the issues that's utmost in your minds, and so we want to understand your thoughts on this matter. So, uh, Alice, Zoe, please come and address us. I don't know, are you coming together? Oh, hello. My name is Zoe Stevens, and I'm co-chair of Watch Youth Council. The council is made up of young people, aged 11 to 18, and it's a place where young people can raise issues and take action on them. Each year we get elected by our peers and campaign on a topic that young people are so passionate about. I've been part of the Youth Council for three years and, it is, and in that time I've been part of many campaigns, including mental health and votes for 16. One of our most successful campaigns is all about climate change as it is a topic that as a generation we are all so passionate about. We created our own social media accounts, informing people what it is like, what climate change is, and what we can do. As we realised, we need to educate the public to tackle the issue. This, is, this way, people are able to be more informed and are able to make decisions to save the climate. We set up local competitions to see who can be Warwickshire's eco-champion. And we promoted the environmentally friendly businesses and petitions in Warwickshire. More recently, we have joined forces with Child Friendly Warwickshire to help Warwickshire bring positive changes for young people. It is a great opportunity that me and Alice can express the views of young people at a regional level where we feel that we can get our voices heard and that our views come across to you all, really. In 2019, Warwickshire Council declared a climate emergency where the issue is brought to the attention from teenagers protesting all over the country. This enabled the council to put in place the following plans. Reducing emissions to net zero by 2050, encouraging the use of public transport and cycling by creating more cycle lanes, increasing the recycling and composting rates by improving the waste collection, and finally, encouraging the use of electric vehicles. Without this movement, I believe that we would not have these plans in place and it is remarkable that it all came to light from Greta Thunberg. This movement changed the way adults look at our generation as it's stereotypical to think we are clueless, uncaring and distant from the world. But we as a generation have been educated and we care about our future. Therefore, we should thank young people who, bought their, who put their beliefs first and took time out of their education their jobs to save the future of this world. We, as young people, played a huge part in this new step, and we are taking, we, we are taking to protect the future we live in. We haven't just been taking part in process in Warwickshire, 
We have also set up eco groups in our schools, encouraging people in our schools to walk and cycle to school or lift share. Group litter picking sessions. I sometimes do that on the way up on the canal. And looking after wildlife. Now, this conference is a start of something new. A chance for us to join together to focus on a goal we are all so passionate about. One of my heroes, John Bender, said, screws fall out all the time. The world is an imperfect place from the Breakfast Club. Now it is our time to change that. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Alice Battersby, and I'm currently the other co-chair of the Warwickshire Youth Council. Over the past few years, I think we've all been very aware that young people have been leading the fight against climate change. Young people such as Greta Thunberg have been making, running strikes, making speeches, and doing everything they can to make sure our future isn't sabotaged. Why is that? Because we've realised what many people, including, crucially, politicians, don't seem to be able to. One, our world is changing. Two, humans are causing it. Three, if we want to stop it, we need to act now. But there's a very obvious problem with the attempts of young people to protest against climate change. We don't have a voice. We can't vote or become MPs. Of course, some young people can have a voice through organisations like Warwickshire Youth Council, but there's an inherent limit to what they can do as well. That's because young people have a thousand obstacles in their way. Imagine the situation of a young person who's worried about the climate and wants to, say, go to a protest in London. First, they might need to miss some school. That might not be a problem if it happens once or twice, but the more often a young person misses school, the more likely it is to affect their grades and the more likely their parents are to refuse. Then they've got to actually go to the protest, which means either their parents will need to take them or they'll need to take public transport, which costs money they might not have. It's certainly not impossible, but it is much more difficult for a young person to do anything, to have any agency. The adults around them buy their food and choose their energy companies and sort out recycling, so it's much more difficult to take personal action as well. It's easy to say, well, young people will have these opportunities in the future, but what if we don't get a future where we can have an impact? What if by the time we're older, it's too late? In some ways, it already is too late. The IPCC recently released a report stating that much of climate change may be irreversible and that it may be impossible to stay within the 1.5 degree limit on global, on global temperature rise. Though young people may one day be able to reduce climate change, we will never be able to destroy it completely. And I think this is part of the reason why young people as a generation can be quite pessimistic about climate change and say any action we can take is essentially useless. But this is not justified. Every action we can take, when combined with a thousand other tiny actions, can make a difference. So we need to try. I am afraid of climate change. I'm afraid that I will live in a world with biodiversity shrinking down to almost nothing because of our changing climate, where droughts and famines and floods are becoming more frequent as each year passes. I'm afraid that this will ultimately lead to the destruction of everything we know. But I'm still hopeful because people are slowly changing their attitudes and their actions, and because we've got to be hopeful, or we will be unable to make any meaningful change. Right now, what young people need is for the whole world to work together. Of every age, every race, every gender, we need your help too. So, to conclude, although young people are willing to help to save the climate in whatever way they can, there is a limit to what they can do. We need adults, the ones with power and knowledge to be willing to work with us, to sacrifice some of their own profit in return for our future, and the knowledge that our species will be able to enjoy this planet for many, many years. So please, on behalf of all young people, I ask you to take what action you can to do everything possible to create a sustainable future. Thank you. That's the voice of the next politicians of the future. So well done, really great congratulations on that and uh, important messages we need to hear.
Um, so we're moving on to the section now, which is going to be the views of local authorities. And in the first group, um, I'll ask uh, if I can have Councillor Heather Timms, who's the portfolio holder for climate change from Warwickshire County Council, one of my colleagues. We've got Councillor David Humphreys um, also going to come forward. And then we've got Tom Shardlow, who's the Deputy Chief Executive Officer at Nuneaton and Bedworth. So we'll take it in that order, if I may, and um, have a few addresses from them. Thank you. Heather, please come forward. Good morning, everybody, and it is really great to see so many faces all together. Uh, firstly, I, I have met today one of my colleagues in Warwickshire County Council for the first time since we started on this journey on climate change. So um, it's been uh, a really interesting to see people's faces and to be able to talk to them, and I'm sure we're going to do a lot more of that. Um, I think I've got some PowerPoints. Ah, oh, yes, there's me. Uh, <laughs> I'm the portfolio holder for Environment, Climate and Culture at Warwickshire County Council. And I'm going to take you a quick trot, I think, through the journey that we've been on. And also, at the end, some of the challenges that, uh, that we have. We've made some commitments. Uh, we have declared a climate emergency for the Council of 2030. That's eight years. Not long. So we've got some work to do. And... I'm very clear that we can only do it together across uh, Coventry and Warwickshire as we move, move forward. We've also joined UK 100, which is a collaboration of uh, local authorities that work together to exchange best practice. And this is really important because it also sets further targets for us. But it also means that we share knowledge. That's absolutely critically important. None of us need to reinvent the wheel. We can all work together to make that difference and also to petition the UK government to ensure that we harness all the power and the funding that we can to this cause. We have pledged to transition Warwickshire as a county 2050, so that is another target there. We have to work collaboratively with businesses, householders, communities and public sector bodies. We have a thread that runs through everything we do of those UN Sustainable Development Goals um, so that we make sure that we deliver on our commitments in a balanced way. Our new council plan, and it was only passed very recently, um, is, is putting climate change as a top priority and we're also looking to ensure that sustainable future for the young people that we had just heard from. Really important to us. Net Zero Council, Net Zero County, our biodiversity, promoting it and safeguarding all of the natural species that we have in Warwickshire, and also then the sustainability, safeguarding our future and ensuring that we um, take this really as a top priority, county, council, country, need, need that to happen. We have been working really hard, uh, but it, the challenge to achieve a net zero Warwickshire is considerable. You can see we, uh, you know, five, five million tons of uh, carbon being emitted. Uh, we, need, we need to do a lot of work. Uh, and the public sector bodies actually only contribute a very small proportion of this, 2%. So very, very small. But we do have an influence on a lot of the emissions that, that, that are there. Transport, for example. That's a big, big sector there. Industry total, 31%. Our little bit, 2%, but our influence is much greater than that, uh, and we need to ensure that we work together to, to use that influence for everybody who works and lives in Warwickshire. We have been um, highly effective in decarbonising our own estate. We've been looking at this very, very carefully. Some things have actually helped us, um, but we need to capture those gains as well. We've taken it down from, to 31%, uh, from something like 11 million tonnes down to 7 million tonnes, 31% down. Uh, that's our buildings, our fleet and our staff business travel. So 
So the graph looks good. It does look good. Um, so we do need to lead by example and do our bit. So we have made some real um, gains in this area and some major reductions, particularly around street lighting, um, electricity within our buildings and the fleet. Those are the areas where we have had successes. But obviously, we've got future challenges, and it just gets harder, doesn't it? We have to make sure our strategy and our working forward is, is really does try to capture these gains. A lot of the drop has been influenced by the COVID pandemic, when uh, obviously our uh, behavior changes around traveling, and many buildings closed, and obviously, you know, there was less car traveling about. So our greatest drop was in, in staff business travels. So we, as we return to this new normality, which I do welcome, by the way, uh, we need to think about our staff working patterns, how, how we capture the, the, those transport gains going forward. We really need to think hard about that and to work with our staff uh, to see what can be done. There's a, there's a hard bit that's coming through, isn't there, of capturing that game. Some of the projects that we've been taking part in is Bedworth Fire Station. Uh, we've put in uh, heat pumps there. We've also put in solar panels uh, in our buildings at the uh, Elliott Park Innovation Centre and obviously LED street lighting controls uh, right across the the piste in Warwickshire have helped us to drive down our um, carbon footprint. Individually, we can also go in on a thing called the place-based carbon calculator and look at what your particular part of Warwickshire actually does uh, produce on, on... You can look at your average footprint in your area. So it'll take you down to about 600-ish uh, households in an area. So if, you want, if you're interested in seeing just what your part of Warwickshire is producing, this could be a very useful tool um, to take a look at. I strongly believe that Warwickshire and all of the councils in the area, we have an enabling role. I talked about that 31% we can influence. Yes, we can. And we need to do it together. So we've got in Warwickshire, we've got the Solar Together scheme, which is basically a reverse auction uh, to encourage uh, solar panels on domestic and buildings. We've also looking at the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. That's with our districts and borough partners. And we're looking at safe and active travel. So those are some of the actions that we will continue to deliver uh, to provide that en enabling role. Now on to one of my favourite topics, because I've really enjoyed this uh, particular area. The Green Shoots Community Fund, which we launched, was a million pounds um, to encourage uh, communities and voluntary sector to get involved in the uh, climate emergency and to really try, try and drive small grassroots uh, projects that would enable people to understand what climate change could mean to them and how we could work through it together. We have 69 applications and 625,000 was funded. And they range from, and I have visited quite a number of them, but they range from a uh, children's forest in Radford Semele to a uh, solar panels on a community building in Rugby, all the way through to insulating certain buildings, lots and lots of projects which have been very, very exciting biodiversity is in there as well to improve what are considered to be neglected areas uh, uh, that communities have recognized need those improvements it has been highly successful it has been highly welcomed as well by communities and, and i know there's a lot more interest now in what uh, community groups can do in their area that's coming forward so we will be launching um, a um, second phase of this uh, later this month. We're talking here, this was at, this Green Shoots Community Fund was actually showcased at COP26 for, uh, by the LGA, so we did gain national recognition for this particular scheme. Um, and you can see a lot more about it uh, when we start to launch um, phase 
phase two. I'm going to talk about the engagement that we've also carried out and will be carrying out. Currently on the Voice of Warwickshire, which is our people's panel, if you like, uh, it has over a thousand people from across Warwickshire on it, and we're doing a climate survey. And we currently have 600 responses from that thousand people. So that is going to inform what we're doing and how we're doing as we go forward. We're also producing uh, some public sector webinars, um, which is going to come out with the, so that we talk about this shared mission and this shared journey um, to contribute to all of our net zero targets. Uh, and initially, we're going to shape the group and the, and the terms of uh, reference around this. We're also producing some business webinars, and they're going out uh, very, very shortly. Um, we've got six events fortnightly, and hoping for 20 plus uh, per web webinar, and we're going to theme those around energy, transport, and the circular economy. So that is quite an important part of the work that we'll be doing with, with businesses. Really want to drive forward with the Coventry and Warwickshire Green Business uh, Program that involves the universities and the, the, our small businesses in Warwickshire, which are really uh, important to, as we move this forward. We're talking about grants, uh, energy, resource audits, and also low carbon product development. So lots of engagement that is going on. Working together on biodiversity is, is absolutely crucial. We've all got that plant a tree for uh, every resident within Warwickshire commitment, so we really need to work together on that. Um, in Warwickshire, we, um, with Coventry and Solihull, we were part of the pilot about the biodiversity net gain, so we're one of the first in the country here. And we have a project on the ground, so it is really exciting to see that in Warwickshire. Um, it, that is about ensuring that the offsetting or net gain from any development and things comes through to Warwickshire and doesn't get exported off to other parts of the country. Really want to see it happening here. Um, and, and we do have some real stars within our staff who are working really hard to, to make this happen. So it's implemented, it's done. DEFRA have recognised it as best practice. And we have a rural planting scheme that's there. And we want to record that all in the West Midlands virtual forest so that we track everywhere we've planted these trees and we know where our green corridors are and where we've got what we call white space, which is where the biodiversity is low. So we know where we've got the gaps and where we need to improve. So, and we're also obviously taking part in the Queen's Green Canopy. I know lots of our residents are getting involved in this, lots of our parish councils, uh, boroughs and districts and everything. They're really, it's really key. And it's fun, isn't it? It really is fun. And I think during the pandemic, we, we recognised how much our green spaces and being outdoors meant to all of us. So it's, it's super that this is happening here. One of the last big areas that the County Council really does have a, an influence on is transport. So we've got our latest Local Transport Plan 4, it's called, which sounds a bit of a mouthful, but it's, it's getting there and we have an agreed inclusion around environment. We have an ambitious plan of uh, 12.3 million to uh, talk about the cycling infrastructure scheme and that's about linking up workplaces and linking up uh, where people live and how to make it easier for people. Also we're talking about new and upgraded uh, cycling infrastructure and we've got funding from internal and external for, uh, sources for this. One of the areas we've also looked at is the canals and waterways uh, in, in our county really key uh, because uh, that can uh, drive a leisure uh, experience that's nice that's really free of the roads and the busy busy areas so really want to be able to link up different areas and link up the um, leisure for opportunities and for our businesses say you go on a nice little bike ride and there's a cafe got to be a good a good story to tell so really pleased with that 
we have uh, a Warwickshire wide website uh, which is all about the climate emergency and it's not just for the county council we're keen to take stories and information from right across Warwickshire and to put it all in one place because it's really quite key for people if they're looking what we're doing and how we're doing it it's there it's in one place you can you can access it so that's our climate uh, emergency website it's a report on how we're doing and how we're progressing of course but it's also, also about everybody uh, getting involved in this and encouraging those behaviours and encouraging those small steps that everybody can, can make. So in, and we want to obviously widen that message out to everybody so that there are links to all of our websites and links to the information that people can contain at both a local level and at a county level and up into the region as well. I did say we've got challenges, and we have, because we have our council plan, and we've also got, uh, coming through the pipeline, our sustainable future strategy. Uh, Josh, you talked about the cost. Yes, we've got to have a costed plan. We've got to know what these things are going to cost us, and then we've got to be able to lobby for those funds to, to meet it. So we've really got those they have a calculated carbon budget so we know exactly where we're going and how we're going to get there really important as far as i'm concerned and really want to be able to implement a climate adaptation plan that ensures resilience for everybody that's you know that retrofitting is a really hard nut to crack and we need to know what it's going to cost we also need to prioritise our sustainable-related uh, actions, so the costs, the benefits, and the ability. Uh, we, need a, we need a roadmap, uh, and we, we will we'll be putting that together. And it will support all of our sustainability objectives in schools, because they're a key element to this as well. I, I think we talked earlier, we know that climate change does affect the most vulnerable in society. And that we need to bear in mind. And we also need to work across all the sectors so we shape and act on climate change policy. And then we go to government with our ask. So it's a challenge, but I think it's a challenge we can all meet if we work together. And that is the real key, I think, to what today is all about. Thank you very much. <laughs> David? You're going to talk to us about North Warwickshire's journey. Thank you. It's the green button. Good morning, I'm David Humphreys from North Warwickshire. <clears throat> in terms of the green area, a, a little bit about myself in one respect. Uh, I spent you know, 50 years working, I have retired now. I've spent a lifetime pushing plastic in, down people's throats effectively. I've worked in the uh, automotive uh, products, households. Every way you turn, I spent a lifetime making sure plastic was at the front end of everything we did. So I am a bit of a pariah in that sense, but we've all had to change. You know, if I go back to um, with uh, local authorities, we were producing window profile for local authorities. Local authorities insisted on using virgin material, no sustainability. Virgin material, the, re the other stuff was when it come out, it was either burnt if it, or landfilled, and, and old plastic windows would actually be just put into the ground. Things have changed where that's concerned now. Um, so we have here at the moment, like North Warwickshire Council declared a climate emergency in October 2019, and it was decided to complete a baseline audit of measures currently in place for the emissions of the council. And one thing that I've recognised since, uh, you know, this is definitely, people would like us to sprint to an end. It's never going to be an end. It's an ongoing, evolving situation. I, and I'm convinced it is definitely a marathon. We have to take our time to do it and have the resources to do it. Uh, outline steps uh, uh, to ensure the council's direct and indirect activities achieve a net zero. 
and that is our aim and our target and we're trying to work towards it. We ensure measures to reduce carbon emissions as well as assessment of carbon consequences of all major projects or, uh, or decisions are considered at board meetings and working groups. Easy words that, but it's difficult to improve, uh, to do. But at now at every meeting, there is a climate agenda as part of moving forward. And plan to and how to engage with residents, workers and businesses to reduce emissions across the borough. So, um, not too long ago, it might be hard to believe, North Warwickshire, a major mining area. A dozen mines in the, the last one in the top of the county closed to become birch coppers in, in 1983. Uh, only a few years ago, Dawn Mill closed because there was a major fire there. But written into our d the design spec for building our social houses, we, they had to be coal-fired, coal-fired heating. So that was still not too many years ago. We were quite happy to put a backseat boiler and put an... Uh, a coal-fired heating because that's how it was thought that's what was always done and we've had to change that I must say over the last 10 years we've never put a coal fire in any council house so looking at our carbon impact um, moving forward baseline study fleet vehicles it'd be nice to change our vehicles for more modern vehicles but they're all diesel powered they're all on 10-year contracts uh, so there's no, no rapid change where that's concerned and hopefully we're going to be able to do it. As I said just now, heating in our own buildings, fortunately our main council offices, we've actually refurbished them four or five years ago and actually reduced the heating bill dram dramatically by changing the whole, the whole system. Uh, we've also made sure that the building is open plan, by open plan it's reduced, it's made it a much more healthy place to to work and also the electricity reduction as well as a result of that. We're also looking at any new buildings where possible to try and put solar power. On our existing council building, the main building, which would, we did look at solar power, it's a steel portal building with a brick clad. It isn't capable of taking the weight. Things are changing in solar panels and hopefully we may be able to consider that in the future. It's all about saving, but saving money and, and saving energy. Uh, progress today is established. We have established an all-party climate change members group, which is cross-party and uh, uh, and it's working uh, working quite well. Currently developing our climate change action plan. So, so it, we declared an emergency in October 19, and we're currently developing this. So it's the whole thing, as I said earlier, is an evolving process. Climate change implications are considered within board reports. As I said earlier as well, there is a champion and there is part of the agenda. Every one of our boards has a, a, a climate agenda as part of what we do. There is a climate champion in each division and we have an officer that is a climate champion for the whole council. Um, working with neighbouring authorities and partners because, and the, uh, I'll say that we're all part of with Coventry and other parts in us, uh, for the MRF, which is... Um, a, a new recycling centre. Again, that's driven not just by being good at recycling, it's also good at uh, cost saving because the gate entry for bringing waste to that recycling centre is reduced from where we do it at the moment. So again, the cost has to come into any of our calculations. And we provide online information and guidance to residents. I will say though, people aren't, it's not a major banging on the door by residents asking us what we're doing about climate change. There are some that do it, We've got to get the me more of the message out to people. Climate change action plan. Our, uh, party, uh, the party member group is working to, on that plan and uh, we're looking at you know, travel and transport. It, the big thing about Warwickshire, it is a rural environment. We have got some three or four major settlements, but the great majority of it is rural. and. Buses are almost, in some places, non-existent or very, very rare. We're going to need to work at what we can do about that. And those buses, we need to work with the suppliers of buses to see what we can do to sort of electrify or do whatever uh, to improve it. Waste, as I said, the, the Murph. I nearly called it the Smurf. That's the nickname for it. And I'm, I'm hoping all the vehicles will be blue at some stage. Um, Building, and including, it says excluding housing, but actually as we're going through the better homes with our own housing, we've got 2,630 uh, 
of our own local authority. We used to have 5,000, but with the right to buy, they've reduced and reduced. And in terms of some authorities, we've got hardly any houses compared to others. But we are working on new bathrooms and all the uh, things that go with it, new housing, insulation, everything, to make it better for the residents that live there. It's quite strange sometimes. You might find somebody who lived there for 50 years and you want to refurbish the house for them, but they don't want anything to do with it because you'll upset them. And it has to wait, unfortunately, till the end of their days, and they don't need to use those houses anymore. But our plan is to make our uh, domestic, uh, our housing, a, a much better uh, um, with retrofitting. Forward planning and development management. We work very closely with our forward planners, uh, with all of the other authorities. The only one it seems to me that we don't ever work with is A5. Yeah, Highways England. I like to mention Highways. I wish Andy Street was here because I always bang on him about the A5 being a major communication. But we do work with everybody in terms of our effects on what happens to other people, uh, and we have to support communities. Obviously, we are uh, uh, doing people in communities in terms of uh, improving leisure facilities and other issues, and make it as, as much as possible. Uh, better for people to use and better for us to provide. Biodiversity and open space management. There is masses of trees and, and work that's going on and projects that uh, you said earlier about plant a tree. I believe there's thousands of trees being planted. Um, but I, I once went up to the New Forest near Scenic Park near Meesham and I looked at where they said, and I stood there with a chap who was introducing me to it and said, we put four million trees in here. It, I don't know if you've ever looked at four million trees, but it doesn't look a lot in when you're actually are there, physically there. But we've put thousands of trees in, and I'm hoping we can put even more in, especially with the Queen's canopy. So highlights from, the dra from our draft action plan. Evaluating a switch from diesel to hydro not, or hydro hydrogenated vegetable oil. And there's going to be other sources as well. Hydrogen will come, etc., in the future. But not ready yet. Plans to reduce carbon emissions from fossil fuels within our buildings. Um, adaption of our buildings to ensure they remain suitable. And retrofitting of existing housing stock, as I said earlier, we're trying to make them much better and, eat, and better homes to live in and cheaper and warmer. Aim to achieve a biodiversity net gain, for example, through local authority treescaping. I said that earlier, but we need funding to help where that's concerned even though there are lots of groups getting together to put things together at the moment. And especially with the Queen's Jubilee, we have people looking to put small forests up here, there and everywhere, and lots of schools involved. And partner in the Sherburne Materials Recovery Facility, as I said, the MRF, which will provide numerous benefits for North Warwickshire and a wider region. But the challenges, there's always challenges. Availability of funding for mitigation and adaption measures measures. We do need help where everything's concerned. We're only a small authority, 65,000 residents. It hasn't got lots of cash to do things, but we try to do as much as we can do. Internal capacity. COVID has been a nightmare in terms of people being, uh, not being able to work, isolation, working from home, uh, and in contact with people. It's made it very, very difficult, and we're working through it. I know Heather just said about it's nice to get back to see each other again, and, and, and it is, um, but then it starts putting pressure on the, uh, the transport and uh, things again where that's concerned. Um, behaviour change, changing behaviours of residents and businesses. People need to buy, buy into it. You know, our stakeholders, we, talk, you know, we do work with work, the Wild Left Trust, we work with Seven Trent. And the landowners, some of the hardest people to work for, work with, are our landowners. You know, they, and, and I'm thinking of areas in and around Colza where the family's been there since 1066. They don't necessarily see a need for change. Uh, and, and they've gone on forever uh, uh, in a very, very similar way with, I wouldn't say, almost a feudal system because it is, some families have been there hundreds of years and it's, made, it's difficult sometimes to get them to work with us. And ensuring regiment, uh, working with lower incomes, with families, trying to do as much as we can to make life as cheap as possible for them to be able to have a full and effective life and be contributors to what happens in North Warwickshire. Thank you very much.
Just wait for the slides. Waiting for me, apparently. Um, firstly, thank you uh, for this wonderful event. It's, it's great to be here, and I'm looking forward to the luxury of, like many others, of putting some faces uh, to, to names. Uh, I'm Tom Shardlow, so I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm the deputy CEO of Nuneaton and Bedworth, and I've been there since, since June, so still relatively new, uh, new to the role. Uh, firstly, apologies from Councillor Chris Wilson, our leader. Uh, he would have very much liked to be here today. Uh, but he wasn't able to get the time away from his, his primary employment. Uh, but I'm joined today by Councillor Julian Gutteridge, our portfolio holder. The presentation I'll put forward today is probably at contrast with, with some of the others you'll hear today, but it does reflect Nuneaton and Bedworth's sort of unique position and challenges and broad political position as well. So who are we, where are we, what are we all about kind of thing. So North Warwickshire, District around 130,000 population and we're strategically linked, we're well placed, we've got good motorway connections, rail connections, a direct line to London, and we're sometimes called the Golden, golden Triangle. Um, primarily urban, so two principal towns, Nuneaton and Bedworth and then some smaller villages and towns around that as well. And we've had a Conservative administration since May 2021 uh, after a long standing period, uh, period of a, a previous administration, so a, a new administration coming to the table. Um, and we're pretty good at attracting growth and investment. Uh, we've done well on LUF funding and, and different parts of money coming in, so that, that's going really well. For us, uh, the, the focus today is around climate change, but I think we're reflecting on the, the broader sense of, of sustainability rather than just, just climate change. Um, I'll, I'll paraphrase because the, the actual quote is quite a mouthful, but the WCD describes sustainability as, as using the resources of now to meet the current needs of now uh, in such a way that doesn't undermine future generations' capacity to meet their, their future needs. So what we do now doesn't undermine the future ability to, to serve future generations. And there's three interlinked pillars described of sustainability. Economic, prosperity, growth, investment, social, educational attainment, health, mobility, equality, well-being and crime, and environmental, climate change, natural resource usage, externalities arising from, from activities and, and biodiversity. And I think today we'll, we'll talk about, well, I'll talk about the, 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 so those three dimensions in the context of Nuneaton and, and Bedworth. So what's it like to live in Nuneaton and Bedworth? Um, well, the average life expectancy is a bit lower than the rest of, rest of the county. We, 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 our people tend to live less. And... Uh, they, they, they live less than the, the Warwickshire average and also the national average. Um, ethnicity is slightly more diverse than the, the, the Warwickshire average, and there's a greater level of, of deprivation in the district. People uh, earn less money and, and, and are more likely to be living in, in poverty. Um, education attainment is also comparatively lower than national averages and it's more likely to, to experience uh, crime. So some, some unique challenges um, there. In, in terms of work, the GVA is lower than, oh, sorry, is lower than national average. Uh, more likely to, uh, sorry, bear with me a second. Yeah, more likely to impact, be impacted by the, by the COVID pandemic, earn less money, but we have good levels of employment, but a lower gross value added per head. Um, that said, we are attracting good business growth and we're a good space for business growth. In summary, uh, the Newton Beth residents are more likely to be raised in poverty. Uh, they're likely to, less likely to reach higher levels of educational attainment, more likely to earn less in their lifetimes, more likely to need their council to support them, more likely to experience worse health and ultimately may live shorter lives than the, the Warwickshire and, and national averages. So a bit of a bit of an inequality picture there compared to uh, the national averages and the rest of the, the, the county. In the context of climate change, it is a recognised challenge, but in some ways it's outshadowed by some of the equality, inequality in the, in the districts. Um, we as an organisation, like many others, have limited financial resources. And we think our biggest capacity is to influence sustainability in the economic and social dimensions around improving residents' lives. Our residents do care about the cost of living, loss of green space, fuel poverty, transportation and decent homes. And some of the points raised earlier about the Ukrainian crisis are driving some of those points home uh, increasingly faster and, and, and stronger. 
we're looking for opportunities that are, are cost neutral uh, or beneficial through grant funding or, or partnership working um, and we're committed to, to working on a sustainability strategy for our organisation and, and our district um, but addressing those three dimensions of, of inequality. Our opportunity, so we're continuing to focus on inequalities. We think we've got a good voice and we think we've got a good opportunity to influence through, through planning, influence the new development of which the district is attracting a, a lot and the use of supplementary planning documents to increase things like biodiversity or sustainability of, of developments. Leveling up our district, some of the points I raised earlier, um, locally and nationally, and our new corporate plan, Building a Better Borough, seeks to, seeks to do that new development and where they are presented, what opportunities do they bring to, to be greener, to be more sustainable. So new leisure centres, town centre transformation, Luff funding, the MRF, etc, etc. How can we, as those opportunities and choices are presented, how can we make the best choice at that, that potential time? Um, deliver a biodiversity strategy in the context of our land holdings. So looking at biodiversity in the context of the land and space that we, we have as a district and where we can look to do things like native planting, wildflower areas, and that sort of thing. Use our geography, which is well placed, as I mentioned previously, to host new green industries. We think we've got an opportunity there to attract business growth, particularly on the green front, with that, that golden triangle and all the connections that we've, we've got. And we're committed to working with partners to secure funding and, and provide space for, for new initiatives coming forward. In terms of our next steps, uh, a new corporate plan will go to our council in April 20. 22 uh, and within that is a priority around sponsoring a sustainable and green approach there's a bit of text there around around that um, so definitely we are committed on that on that front um, we'll continue to support our residents in leveling up and across those three dimensions of of sustainability economic social and environmental we will establish a sustainability strategy by the end of 2022 and we'll continue to seek opportunities for partnership work and deliver against those those three dimensions um, and as opportunities present and as we, we do deliver new developments and those decisions come forward, we will look at those at that point within the financial limits we have to make them as green and sustainable uh, as, as possible. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the first um, part. Excuse me, he's taller than me, isn't he? Uh, the first part of our um, views from local government. And we've got a break now. We're going to have a cup of coffee back in the room at the back there. And then when we come back, we're going to have three more local government perspectives. And we've got rugby, Warwick District Council, and we've got Coventry City Council as well, um, which I'm going to look forward to. And after that, we've got a Q&A session. So um, if we can, we, we've caught up with ourselves, which is fantastic. Thank you, speakers, very much. Um, and can we go grab a coffee and come back in here at about 11 o'clock, and then we will hear the next lot, and then we'll uh, get those questions going. Thank you very much, everyone.
move on to the next part of today's session. Um, and and I'm, I'm very conscious for all of you who are here from business and from partners that you're very much getting a, a local government perspective at the moment. But we felt this was really important that you should understand how local government are trying to get their mind around this agenda and how we're, we're sort of working individually. And perhaps at the end of this, one of the collective decisions will be how we actually start to come together to move the agenda forward. So three down, three more to go. And I'm starting with Emma Crane, who, Councillor Emma Crane, who is, has joined us, who is the Rugby Borough Council member. And then we will invite Alan Reid, who's with us over there, and Ian Shenton to come from Warwick and from Stratford. And then finally, we'll have Jim O'Boyle from Coventry City. So, Emma, do kick us off. Thanks, Susie. Well, hi, everyone. It's great to be here today and to talk to you a bit about what Rugby Bar Council is, is doing to take climate action. Um, the climate change challenge is absolutely huge, but it's one that we really, really need to tackle and one that we're really excited about tackling at Rugby Bar Council. It's so important for our children and for our grandchildren and the future of our planet. And we've heard from young people today about how strongly they feel about this. So it's something that's fantastic to see everyone coming together today to take action on it. Um, I've put this, this picture in the slide, the earth warming stripes, because I think it just demonstrates in one picture what we're up against. The, the red that you see is, is the warming over recent years, and you can see there's a huge proportion of warm days in the last decade and couple of decades. So I think it just visualizes the challenge that we're up against. Um, in rugby, the approach we've taken is that there are many co-benefits to taking action on climate change as well. There are better health outcomes for residents, both physical and mental health. They will have better access to open spaces and nature. We'll have more trees, less pollution, warmer homes, cheaper energy bills, which in today's energy crisis will be so important. And it will also bring good quality jobs and skills to the area. So I've set out our net zero vision on the slide, and it's what we at Rugby Borough Council are all working towards. We set an ambitious target of net zero by 2030 for the council, and this vision is going to guide all of the work towards achieving net zero over the coming years. And as well as recognizing that it's a climate crisis, we also recognize that we're in the midst of a biodiversity crisis as well, with many species at risk of extinction in the UK. And we're keen to take action to address both of those linked crises at the same time. So reducing emissions and restoring nature in rugby, because the two go hand in hand and we can't solve one without the other. We need to do them together. So we'll be prioritizing both in our action plan. And we're really, really keen to engage with all of our residents on this. It's a journey that we all have to take together, and we need everyone to come on that journey with us. So I wanted to say a few words about our journey so far. So like many other local authorities, our journey began when we declared a climate emergency in July 2019, and we quickly set up a cross-party member working group to decide on those immediate actions which we needed to do and to set the council's strategic direction. We appointed some consultants to help us get an emissions baseline so we know where we are now and where we need to get to over the next eight years to 2030 and beyond. And then our climate change ambitions were further clarified in our new corporate strategy, which we adopted in February 2021. And climate change was one of four priority outcomes identified to guide all of the Council's future work. And we also included commitments to improving biodiversity across the borough. And we recognised that we needed to better understand the views of our communities and to engage with them about our net zero plans. And we wanted to reach out and hear the views of businesses, residents, voluntary groups and others. So we decided to host a climate summit late last year 
where we had a really informative conversation and we were able to listen to the strength of feeling amongst our local residents, businesses and, and other groups for action on climate change and nature recovery. And we also set up a dedicated microsite called Rugby Net Zero where we're providing information for residents about our climate plans and also how they can take action to reduce their emissions. We also delivered a residence survey so that we could understand better how local people felt about taking climate action. And we got over 600 responses to this. And it was really interesting, the findings of that, because we found that 94% of respondents were concerned about the impact of climate change or biodiversity loss. So that's, you know, virtually everyone wants to see something done about this. And it also interestingly highlighted that 47% of residents felt that they understood climate change a little or not at all. So I think that really showed to us that we've got an education challenge on our hands as well to, to raise awareness of what we need to do and why. And then we also looked at our senior leadership team and we appointed a, both a counsellor climate change champion for rugby, that's me, who's going to help to raise the profile of climate action amongst members and residents. And we've also got a lead officer, Dan Green, who's here today, who's our deputy executive director. So having two members of the senior leadership team jointly responsible for delivering on climate change is really important to show leadership and to drive the change that we need. And partnerships as well is a really, really important aspect. So whilst we're developing our climate change strategy, which I'll come on to talk a little bit about later, we're also taking action right now because delivery in this decade is just so, so important. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of the things that we've been doing. One really key thing that we've done, which I think has made a real difference and I hope it will over time as well, is we've introduced a climate change and environmental impact assessment for all the decisions that the Council and Cabinet make going forward. And this means that it's a key driver for all the decisions to be taken. It's embedding consideration of climate change and biodiversity loss across everything that we do. So it's like a green thread, if you like, through all of our Council business. And at the same time as we've done this, we've started to upskill both officers and members. So we're offering comprehensive climate training programs to everyone in a bid to increase the knowledge. Because if you're having to take action on this, we think it's really important that everybody understands why uh, and why it's so important and what needs to happen. And one project that we're doing at the moment that I just wanted to specifically highlight about how we've embedded climate change across that is we're regenerating some of our high-rise blocks at Byart Place and we're creating new homes for social rent. So we've made sustainability a key priority in the development of that project. One example of this is we've decided not to put the development onto the gas grid. We're just going to go straight onto heat pumps. We're also looking at things like... Uh, um, including solar PV and space for wildlife and access to nature. And we're also working with our planning teams about ideas about how to reduce the number of parking spaces, things like car clubs, thinking creatively about how to drive down car use in that development. One key area as well we've taken action on is to do with funding. And we've set aside ring-fenced funds in our budgets to deliver our net zero vision. We've still got work to do on that because obviously it's an ever-evolving thing. But we, we've flagged it up in our budgets as something that we know is coming in the, next, in the next few years. And we've begun to retrofit our houses as well. We've got about 3,500 social rented homes. And we're, we're carrying out an audit, first and foremost, to see where we are now in terms of energy efficiency and where we need to get to in order to make all of our properties net zero. And that sounds like an awful lot, but actually it's just the start of everything. Um, so what we're doing next and what is our main focus of our climate working group is developing our climate change strategy and action plan. This is actually fully drafted now, and it's setting out our approach to delivering, championing, and supporting the transition to net zero in rugby. 
We're going to be consulting on this immediately after the elections, and we're really, really keen to hear from residents and partners about what they think about our strategy and if it includes all the things that they've been talking to us about over the last year. And in advance of that public consultation, we've done some early consultation with key stakeholders, just getting their views and, and entering into a dialogue with them. And we, we really want to ensure that we've listened to everybody and it's a truly joined up and collaborative approach. But of course, it's, it's not a straightforward process and a number of the speakers earlier have talked about the challenges they face and I just wanted to flag up some of the challenges we're facing as well. Um, a practical challenge is the fact that rugby itself as a council is only responsible for about 1% of the borough's overall emissions. So how do we help to reduce the other 99% of the emissions and how can we take that leadership role to, to inspire people to make the changes that need to happen? And then in rugby, we've got a really high level of industrial emissions. They account for about 61% of emissions. So again, that's going to involve collaboration with industry to see how we can, we can get those emissions down in the future. And we're acutely aware of the cost of living crisis and the energy price crisis at the moment. So we really want to focus on those vulnerable residents and make sure that the action we're taking to reduce emissions doesn't disproportionately impact them and their lives. And actually, some of the changes that we can make, particularly around energy efficiency, can actually help to reduce bills for vulnerable people and, and give them warmer homes as well. So we see it as a win-win as a and a positive situation. And for us in rugby, biodiversity is a key challenge as well. We're one of the, the most sort of biodiverse depleted areas, actually. I haven't got the exact figures, but we've got very, very low tree coverage in Rugby Borough. So we really want to do more to help that. And we've been working with the Wildlife Trust on that. And then things like the risks from extreme weather events, we're already seeing a lot of flooding happening. Again, what measures can we put in place? We need to work with our planning teams. We need to work with central government, make sure our national planning policy framework is fit for the future and fit for a net zero future, and that we're not building homes that, that aren't. And then I think really finally, a huge barrier is funding and capacity. And we'll certainly be lobbying central government for more funding for local authorities. We, we did actually apply for the uh, social housing decarbonisation fund recently because we wanted to retrofit some of our properties and we didn't get it, we weren't successful, um, which is really disappointing and we really, really want to get the next round. Um, so we'll definitely be lobbying. We've been thinking of other creative ways to raise funds as well. And we're investigating issuing a council climate bond, which can involve the local community in, in being invested in the investments that we're making. And there's a new UK infrastructure bank, which has just been set up, which has funding available for local authorities. We're also investigating options there as well. So I think the overall message from rugby is that we're doing a lot, we've got a lot more to do, but collaboration is really, really key in this and we need to bring everyone along in the journey. And that's why it's great to be here today because we can all work together and share our ideas and we've already picked up some really good ideas. So that's just a slide showing our emerging approach of our strategy, but I think in order to conserve time, I won't go into too much detail on that. So thank you for listening. Um, we're really excited about the journey ahead. The easy bit is getting up on stage. The hard bit is getting off as you get older. Um, so this rather suave gentleman is... is uh, Councillor Alan Reid of, of Warwick District Council. I forgot my tie, so um, I'm not qu dressed quite as, as suavely as, as Alan. And before anybody says it, no, we're not the elderly version of the Chuckle Brothers. <laughs> okay, so Alan's going to start the, uh, the, the process with the slides. We're, we're going to go slightly off piece because, quite frankly, <coughs> you've, heard, you've heard so much from ah. all, the other, all the other district councils. Um, I think it's important really that we first of all say that Stratford District Council and Warwick District Council are working together and that is quite an important start for, for what we're going to say today. The other thing I wanted to say 
is that this is far too important to be anything to do with party politics. And I, uh, <coughs> my programme advisory board people are all here today, co uh, chaired by Councillor John Neary. And I think that's important that we, could, we don't put this into a party political event. It's far too important for that. So we'll start. If I know how to work this. So we, we've declared the emergency, we've done all the things that everybody else has been talking about this morning. Um, and, and I think it's important that, uh, I think some of you knew that we were originally going to have a referendum to, uh, to, to raise funds through the, the, the local c council tax. COVID put, put, put that to bed and we don't currently have any plans to, to resurrect that idea, but we'll come back to the funding later. <clears throat> What was important was, because we're working together, we've actually appointed a programme director, Dave Barber, and he is leading us, the two councils, in all that we're doing in climate change, and that was probably the most important appointment we made over the last few years. This is really where we want to start to talk to you, really, because this sets out our plans. We have three ambitions. First of all, the councils have got to be net zero by 2025. Itself a challenge. Ambition two is South Warwickshire to be net zero by 2030. That's all been said already today, and that can only happen if we all work together. And ambition three, which is just as important, is adaptation. <clears throat> we all know that the climate change is not going to avoid the increase in temperature. So we've got to have plans in place for adaptation, and that's very much what Ian will want to talk about later. That's the challenge. Our council buildings, our business travel, and the major contracts. And one of the important things about our major contracts is we are now put into, a, into our pro procurement process that people have got to set out how they are going to reduce their carbon emissions if they're going to be successful in a, being awarded a contract by our district councils. Those are the carbon emission challenges. Again, it's been said already this morning, so I don't want to dwell too much on that. We all know what, where the, I mean 90% is transport and housing, and that's where we've got to make the biggest challenge. And here are some of the progresses. I mean, Ian, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, that, that, that's great. Um, and the first thing to, to mention is that um, this, the, 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 the ambitions that we've come up with um, are joint. Everything we do is joint. Our, uh, our programmes, we, we, however, nuanced between the two authorities, but it shows that we can work together, even though, uh, uh, if you like, Warwick are a lot more urban than Stratford. For instance, Warwick covers an area of roughly 285 square kilometres, I think something like that. Stratford's is 978 square kilometres. We're very much more rural, but the themes are the same. So here, we've, we've been talking uh, uh, about decarbonising our buildings and we're, we're using green electricity, all the usual stuff, and I don't intend to, to talk through each of these, these bits. We are looking at, uh, at the, uh, if we look at the bottom, Thing, uh, bottom part of the slide there, uh, looking at uh, a, a hydrogen hub and the feasibility of that. We can't go into too great a detail on that today, but we, it, needless to say, we are looking at that staff travel, etc. If we move on to the next slide, though, there's some things I wanted to just briefly talk about. Up there, you'll see Margot mentioned um, Pashley's and e-cargo bikes. Well, if you wondered what one looked like, that's an e-cargo trike. We have to, we've, we've, we've successful in getting um, 60,000 pounds from the DFT towards 10 bikes, five bikes, five trikes. We had to match fund that, so 60, another 60,000. So 120,000, we are going to loan these out to businesses. Trikes will carry roughly 100 kilos of product and bikes will carry 50 kilos. And we're going to hire these out for free to businesses to try and encourage them to use these for the last mile. 
a very important in Stratford that we look at the vehicle on the on the left we have roughly 75 um, charging points across our car parks nowhere near enough for what's coming down the track vehicles there are 40 million vehicles in this country the number of electric vehicles is on the rise so 75 just doesn't cut it here we need a lot more we look at um, uh, domestic energy we've been successful in getting funding from various schemes from the lad scheme i know emma mentioned that they weren't uh, you didn't actually get the funding from the latest scheme and that's one of the key problems i think that uh, district councils face or smaller councils and it's a competitive process and a lot of councils don't have that uh, ability to compete and don't have the expertise to get the funding. We've been lucky we've got some funding, but it is hard going. And collectively, we could probably put more pressure um, on, the, on, on the government and, and win some of, uh, some of these bids, or win some of these rounds of funding. We, we, we all know about the Build Back Greener um, uh, if you like a uh, uh, project uh, that the, the government announced there's a lot of aspirational stuff in there yet to see the detail on how we're going to get the funding down at our level and again it's going to be competitive in my opinion and so we need to as a, as a group um, apply for funding a bit in a more coordinated way tree planting biodiversity well we, we, that's, Ken, that's Kenilworth I think that's your area, isn't it? Um, and I'm aware that county-wise, we have the, the Verges policy, the emerging Verges policy, which will help. Um, we have all these roads, all these Verges. Why not rewild some of them? So uh, that, that's on its way through. Yeah, and the only other thing, which is also important, again, because the two councils are working together, we're working together on a new local plan, which will have, at its very heart, climate change. And incidentally, Warwick District Council has set aside £18 million for net zero for council housing. £18 million. That's a lot of money. So here are some of our plans. It's a three-year climate change action plan. We've already had, I think it's £3.5 million from the decarbonisation funds for, for our local housing. We're delivering a large-scale tree planting. In fact, the, um, the council agreed uh, to uh, start that off with a 300 million, 300,000, I beg your pardon, uh, for tree planting. And there's a very ambitious scheme of 160,000 trees by 2030. We're promoting the better points, sustainable travel, where people get points from local, local uh, organisations if they can demonstrate that they're using alternatives to, to car, to, go, to travel to work. And that is also important for the Commonwealth Games, where our district, Warwick District, has got uh, quite a lot of involvement in the Commonwealth Games with bowls and cycling. Some of the headlines for our plans. Yeah, on, on, on this, we, you can see at the top, we talk about the, the, the green hydrogen refuelling and solar generation. One of the, one of the, the uh, feasibility studies that we've also got running is to use, to, to try and put solar canopies on one of our service, surface car parks, our leisure centre car park, basically. The early indications say that if we are able to do that, we can power the, the, uh, the leisure centre and the uh, businesses around that area by using a direct wire. However, as we've seen more recently with all the storms, there is a slight problem that's, that's sort of um, come up with that, with, uh, and we're trying to work through it in that the wind gets under these canopies and all of a sudden we lose them and we see them fly off into the distance. So we are work having a close look at that. The local engagement scheme, engaging parish councils and rural communities, one of the big problems is getting down into communities, bringing communities along with us. Now, earlier on, uh, in one of the other slides, it spoke about the UK 100. I think it was in Heather's slide. And we were successful at Stratford and Warwick 
in uh, getting through uh, a round uh, of interviews. There were 75 councils applying for funding. We were one of the five that got funding. And that funding is specifically to create champions within parish and town councils. And that, for me, is key. We must get down to individual residents, individual localities, and this was, is one of the ways. And the UK 100 are going to be helping us to do this. We will train up 20 people initially, and they will train others, and hopefully we can reach out into the, the, into the, village, the smaller villages and towns. When we look at... Um, uh, adaptation and, and, and Alan will know that as already alluded to the fact that I am very keen on adaptation um, I ha I, it worries me that the, the latest IPCC report, the CCC report uh, all the, the, the UN report all of them say the same things nowadays that one and a half degrees is going to be challenging to, uh, to, to reach and hold that so we have to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And my view is adaptation, and, and I know Baroness, Baroness Brown felt the same way about this, adaptation is important. It is very important and it's been the, uh, the, the poor relation of this up to now. So we have to do more. We, we did last year commission the Met Office to write a report to tell us exactly what would various uh, increases, 1.5, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, 4 degrees. What would that mean for Stratford and Warwick? One year on, we're still waiting for that report. We were promised it last, last year in October, um, and we're still waiting now. Um, we, it's, the, the dates have progressively gone back, so we asked for it roughly a year ago. So we're now falling back on the West Midlands Combined Authority Sustainability Report that came out recently. And we're going to build up our approach to adaptation through that. But the key is working with, with, in partnership with other organisations. We've already, we work in partnership, we talk. We don't always agree uh, on everything. But it shows that we can produce um, results between us. And we find common ground and we work through it. Um, Alan mentioned it's cross-party. We have the leader of the Liberal Democrats here, Susan Junid, who is, who is on the climate change panel along with myself. We work as a group, not, no party politics involved in this. We, we, so I'm very keen, uh, as Alan is, that we take out the party politics part of it. I don't know if you want to add anything else to yeah, that at I, the moment. I just want to say a bit more about the green hydrogen. Uh, for those of you who don't know what green hydrogen is, it's hydrogen produced from... Uh, sustainable electricity and we've, we've uh, appointed uh, consultants to give us a business case for a hydrogen hub in our district because I personally believe we've got to have an alternative to EV uh, otherwise we're, we're, we're not going to be able to give uh, the, the transport the sustainability that it needs. So the green hydrogen <coughs> uh, will happen if the business case uh, uh, is sound because it will be uh, totally connected to a solar farm. And that's how, that's how it's going to be green hydrogen. The other thing I'd like to also say about the parish councils, my own village, Barford, has already, and I don't take the credit for this, but it's just a, a, a good example of how you can go down into the parish councils and the town councils. And Barford have got uh, an organisation called Bar Zero, and they meet regularly to, uh, to see how the, the village can do something about uh, climate change. And every Sunday, they have a repair workshop, a bit like the TV programme, but obviously on a smaller scale. And people take away uh, anything that they would otherwise have thrown away to the repair workshop to see if it can get repaired. And that's the sort of example that I think we all need to, 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 to pay more attention to. Uh, just just to, to, to add on to the organisations and agencies partnership, um, we're working with the Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust, the Heart of England Forest, and with Witchbold, um, a neighbouring authority. And, and Izzy has, has stuck two fingers up at me, so I'm not, I think she's telling me it's, we've got two minutes. <laughs> so we, we move on to our last slide. 
<laughs> well, before we do go on to the next slide, there is one thing which is very close to my heart, and that's to do with the development uh, 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 planning document. We uh, at Warwick uh, have, have got out a second consultation for a document to get sustainable housing net zero. I don't know how many of you drive past new housing, all of which is same old, same old. And we've got to change that mindset. Unfortunately, the government is far too slow in, in coming forward with new planning and building regulations. So we set this DPD out, and we hope that by the end of this year, or very early 2023, we will have in place a document which will make every new house be sustainable. And that, to me, is the, one of the most important things that we're doing. The challenges we face. Yeah. I think I mean, we, we've already spoken about community engagement um, uh, to a certain degree. Um, my view is, is very much we, keep, we have to keep it simple. And, and one of the simplest ways, that one area of, the, of the work that we all do that touches absolutely every single person in our county is through the waste system. So reuse, recycle, re uh, reduce, all this, these sort of messages we need to, to, to get over and to show people how to, how to, what to put in their bins. So simple stuff like that. The, uh, and I think we were both, both encouraged by the two young ladies that spoke at the very beginning. We were so impressed by them. And we both, I, I, I know, I, we, we both feel that one of the things we must remember is, and I, I, when I talk to groups, and I talk to church groups a lot and, and to parish councils, one of the things I often say to people there is, I won't be around to see the worst excesses or the worst issues with climate change. I'm unlikely to be alive. My son will be, his children and his children. And it's for those young people that we, are, we must always bear in mind, it is their future. We need to harness their, them as well, their, their passion for it. And as they say, as they mentioned, we need to encourage them to, to actually take a more active role. Um, they spoke very eloquently, and I, I believe we both share that, that same yeah, opinion agreed. on that. Finally, funding. Everybody says we don't get enough funding from central government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But these two councils, we have put together five hundred million pounds in our budget for this year for climate change, and that is not all, of course, because of course every one of the portfolios. And, and let me give you a good example: asset housing. They are putting together an awful lot of money from decarbonisation funds and the eighteen million I mentioned already. So we are addressing it as much as we can as a local authority, but we do need more funds from local, from central government. I think that's all we've got to yep. say. Thank you. We'll go. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm going to work out how this works. Uh, I, think I think that's mine, is it? No, it isn't. Right. Have we got my presentation by any chance? Might, might be helpful, otherwise this is going to be really awkward. <laughs> Do you want to talk amongst yourselves whilst we... That's what happens when you get people like me on the technology.
I bet I better have made this worth waiting for now, haven't I? <laughs> I I'm sure I'm sure they've done that deliberately. But uh, look, you know, can I just firstly thank you, the organisers, in particular, Easy Warwickshire County Council, because I know that you were the instigators of this, and it's a really good opportunity for us all to get together and thank our hosts, uh, Warwick. Uh, university as well for hosting us today. I, I've been to the Slate on a number of occasions and it's a great venue and I encourage more people to come and use this this venue and it's a great great view as well of course and of course it's in Coventry I would say that wouldn't I? Warwick University is in Coventry. I always have to make that point you know so look um, hopefully I'm not going to repeat uh, what colleagues have said today, because on anything like this, you will always get a certain amount of overlap. Um, but I want to go slightly differently today, because Coventry is a good starting place. It was one of the first cities to produce a climate change strategy in 2012, and we we're already meeting the carbon reduction targets that were set uh, in that ambitious plan at that stage. And we're well placed because we're home to some of the best R&D facilities anywhere in the world. Two leading universities, obviously Warwick, as I said, and Coventry University as well, who are recruiting some of the best and the brightest and a good skilled workforce ready to lead the way in uh, the new look industrial landscape. As a city, we're addressing climate change, developing more resource and energy efficient technologies. And we have other important innovations and we'll be providing an excellent opportunity for our local economy and for job creation and it also offers us an opportunity to improve life for those on low incomes affected by fuel poverty and poor air quality and food poverty and whilst at the same time helping us to address uh, reducing waste and identify commercial opportunities to create a more sustainable future but we have a huge challenge. And one of the things I always say to people is that our role and my role and all our roles in local authorities is not about uh, solving climate change. We can't do it on our own. We've already heard, you know, rugby, you know, 1% of the overall CO2 emissions come from rugby borough council, exactly the same in Coventry. So if we went carbon zero tomorrow, it wouldn't really make a mark really in real terms on the uh, addressing the issue of real climate change not just in our country but across the world this doesn't have any any borders we've got to be really serious about how we address this we can use our leadership role and we can advocate and we can we can lobby but ultimately this is all about our communities our industry our people actually coming together to address this. Councils will not even touch the surface, but we can certainly lead a way in how it is we want to, to do that. And that is why one of the things I wanted to do when I first got this role was to set up Coventry's Independent Climate Change Board. And it's here to share policies, plans, good practice, and to work together collaboratively to keep the city on track for a zero carbon future. And I will say this now, and sometimes this is a little bit controversial, but it needs saying, um, Coventry haven't set a date as to when it will be carbon zero. And the reason why it hasn't set a date is it can't be achieved by Coventry City Council. And myself and my leader, George Duggins, will never be the people that stand up here or elsewhere and say, we're going to bring our city carbon zero by date when we know we haven't got the tools, we haven't got the resources, we haven't got the policies to actually make that happen. But actually what we can do is advocate, as I said, very, very strongly and actually show how we bring the different industries and people together to actually start demonstrating real change in this area. And one of the key points, and we'll touch on this, is we need to make sure that we bring our communities together. But to do that, we need to demonstrate action and not, and not words. And can I say, and I know Margot addressed you earlier on, on video link, uh, I, was, I approached Margot last year because Margot's got a wealth of experience uh, in the political sphere 
And as a colleague said earlier on, and he is absolutely right, for me, this has never been a party political issue at all. Because ultimately, you know, we all live, we've got one planet, we've got one opportunity, we need to get this right. And Margot was an ex-Conservative government minister. And that ability to get to the parts of power that, uh, for example, myself, my colleagues might not be able to reach is key in order to bring the decision makers and those power brokers together to really make a huge difference that we alone would not really achieve. So I'm really delighted Margot agreed to be the chair of the independent uh, board. And of course, one of our great partners in Coventry, Warwick Manufacturing Group, uh, where we're doing a number of projects uh, with them, of course, Margot is the executive chair. And we have a broad range of senior representatives from businesses located in the city, public service providers and community organisations who are all committed to making the board work and achieve our plans for the future of the city. And I, I, like I said, the board is, is about action, it's not about words. We're not going to present, we're not going to develop a, a lovely shiny report for people to read. I want to see demonstrable evidence projects that can be demonstrated in our city in our region that can then lead the way as to how we tackle the real issues of climate change and a number of projects will come forward and we also want to communicate how residents of all ages can be involved we must collaborate if we are to reduce our carbon footprint and this applies to the public sector the commercial sector charities and voluntary groups of all sizes uh, hopefully JLR will be joining our board. We've got E.ON on our board. We've got Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. I know Ed Green is here today. We've got uh, 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 the third sector, uh, the public sector on this. Absolutely important that we do that. Now as a board, we've identified five key pathways from low carbon development to sustainable travel and transport and we're working to decarbonize our own buildings as a local authority and as all these businesses and encouraging businesses and industry to join us coventry's installed 30,000 lighting columns across the city and we have solar panels that we are currently uh, installing across 40 plus buildings in our city and of course we've worked through the european regional development fund uh, monies that were available in through the coventry and warwickshire green business program and of course again this is about action about policies that actually will make a difference coventry is leading the charge as part of the west midlands gigafactory just up the road at, at a, what was coventry airport it has the potential to create thousands of new jobs and to power the green transport industrial revolution i like to see this as climate change is an existential threat to our world and to our people, but it also presents us with a, an opportunity, an economic opportunity, because if we get this right and we take people with us, that's where we will make the single biggest change. And those organisations and businesses that are sometimes seen as the, the organisations that are the problem, whether it's the utility companies, the gas electric, the, you know, the, uh, whether it's the, the transport industry, if they're to survive in the future, they need to bring forward green technologies. So why wouldn't you work with them? Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you, you know, make sure that they come forward with those great ideas and plans? And that is the whole point of our climate change board. Other examples we have in in Coventry, as was said earlier. Um, Coventry is more electric charge points than anywhere else in the country outside of London. We've got plans to install a huge more, a huge lot more, and of course there are other plans across the region as well. I know George would have said earlier that all of our uh, buses in 2025 will become all electric, the only city in the country to do that. And we have a fantastic collaboration, as I mentioned, with Warwick Manufacturing Group, Transport for West Midlands, and Dudley Council to apply innovative research and development to the urban light rail sector 
just making the point again, as a colleague mentioned earlier, it's not political. Dudley is run by the Conservatives. I made it absolutely clear all along we'll work with whoever we need to in order to bring forward the best, most innovative green plans that we can as a city. VLR, Coventry Very Light Rail, is to create... The, the aim is to create a reliable, environmentally friendly, battery-driven, hop-on, hop-off transport system that will work at a fraction of the cost of a traditional tram. It's a pioneering world first. It will operate autonomously at a high frequency to provide a turn-up and go service. Coventry is also looking at, believe it or not, self-charging roads. Western Power Distribution is exploring the feasibility of wireless on-the-go charging for electric vehicles. A study, which is the first of its kind in the UK, will assess the viability of charging electric vehicles as they are driven by using wireless in inductive technology placed under road surfaces. And in a world of connected and autonomous vehicles, Coventry is also in the driving seat. We are part of UK Auto Drive, a £19 million three-year project bring bringing together 12 private, public and university partners to develop and deploy driverless technologies on the streets of Coventry and Warwickshire. And I'll just touch, because I know a colleague touched on it earlier, retrofit of, of domestic properties. Um, you'll hear later on, as part of our plans as, 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 a, 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 as a climate change board, we've, we, we've commissioned a report uh, from Leeds University as to how to get to uh, carbon zero. And one of the things that is absolutely clear, the challenge is mighty. And just retrofitting uh, all the domestic uh, properties in Coventry would cost more than the whole country spending on climate change policies as we speak now. Um, and never mind older uh, buildings and older domestic properties, there are, there are you know, houses being built at the moment that are not... They, they, they are not uh, future-proofed at all. They can't be. Uh, heat pumps can work, but only in the setting in which the building is designed to meet them. You know, and it is absolutely... The, 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 the incredible amount of money this is going to cost is extraordinary. And that's why we need the collective might of our economy to really uh, make this happen. And across the other pathways, the Climate Change Board has identified that has identified already more than 90% of Coventry's residual waste is diverted from landfill and instead sent to the energy from waste plant up at London Road in the heart of Coventry. It's actually an old facility. It's been around since the 70s, believe it or not. It's moved on, but Coventry was ahead of the game uh, there. Uh, Coventry's business, the, the Business Sustaining Green Business Programme is also helping companies reduce waste and encourage recycling and reuse of energy and raw materials. As I mentioned about Warwickshire Wildlife Trust, I thought I'd better get some photographs of some nice greenery in this as well. We're working uh, across partners such as the Wildlife Trust on key initiatives in the city, such as the River Sher Sherborne Valley Project, which is worth two and a half million pounds. So. This is my last slide, and I shall leave you in peace. And my apologies, I, I, I do have to go back to work now, so I'm not being rude if I just slip out the side. But I really hope that you get something out of today and you bring your thoughts and ideas uh, to the party. And one of the things, if, I, if, I take, if you get no other message from today, we can't do this alone. We need to work together to actually make this happen. But we've made a good start. We need to do more and we need to advocate. We need to, we need to challenge and we need to actually say as a country, if we, if we, if we want to say it, we've got to do, if we want to do it, if we want to say it, we need to do it. And, you know, that, that, is, that is where we are. And I hope that as a result of this conference today, we're all able to move together uh, forward in this work in the weeks and months in years to come. So, Izzy, thank you very much, and I shall leave you in peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, Jim. And um, it's 
always a delight to follow on from Jim. Actually, it isn't always because he is very eloquent and he does a fantastic job. And, um, uh, you know, one of the benefits is actually this university sits across both counties, both the county and the city. And I think it exactly replicates the working relationship that we have about how we are better together and can do more. And our Coventry and Warwickshire LEP footprint, our health foot footprint, all of that just it is that prime example. And if we're going to get much out of this, and for all of those people within our area, businesses, partners, knowing that we work well together and have that same intent is hugely important in this step forward. So you have been on receive for many hours. Now is your moment. I'm going to ask all those who can to come forward, um, join me up here. Uh, those who were presenting uh, just before, please come and sit in these um, chairs. I, I probably won't because it doesn't look as if I'll ever get out of one. So I may well stay here and, uh, and try and spot the roving microphone. So whilst everyone um, comes up and takes a seat, please do, um, can you start to pop your hands up? There's one. Fantastic. I'm going to take, uh, we have two, we have three. Uh, first three, I'm going to take those as they come. So um, who's got the roving, right, one there, one over there. Um, right, so the first one will come from that lady down. Gentlemen, can't see that far. Um, and then Perfect. Susan Junid here, and then we've got Tim over there. So starting at the back. Um, good uh, morning. Well, it's afternoon now, everybody. I'm Councillor Christine Thomas. I'm the Chair of Licensing at Coventry City Council. Um, I just want to chuck a off-the-head idea at, at folk for them to have a think about and take away, particularly the panellists. Uh, do you not think that now is the time for a central pot with a per capita levy to be created to allow all seven authorities to work across boundaries to tackle specific issues about climate change. And could I please make a suggestion, could we please begin with taxi licensing? Because Coventry has a plan to uh, electrify all of its taxis, and that's all well and good. Um, but as we know, and no disrespect to the gentleman from Nuneaton and Bedworth, Nuneaton and Bedworth taxis do work in Coventry, so it's absolutely defeating the object if we electrify all our cabs and we then have diesel cabs coming from Nuneaton and Bedworth and working in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great. We, we may well come to you um, first and, and also uh, just to say that uh, Brett Williams has joined us on behalf of Coventry as, as you're aware George and Jim have had to um, get on with some other stuff at the moment so we've got that covered as well. Um, Susan, please, to you. Do say who I, you are uh, as well. Yeah. Susan Juned, um, I'm a district councillor, but I've actually worked in climate change uh, as a professional since about 1986. So my question really is, um, I, I have a sense of frustration and deja vu. Um, so hmm. my questions are, can, how, how can you keep the commitment that you've shown today? How can you... Um, go forward in face of some of the difficulties, particularly when you see changes of priority, maybe at government level and maybe funding problems, and, and ha you know, to address the problems. And then the other th question is, how are you going to communicate? Because as several people have said, you need to have everybody with you. So how are you going to involve and communicate with wider communities about what you're doing and how everybody else can get involved as well? Brilliant, thank you. Absolutely. And, and in fact, the first part of your um, question links quite well to our previous colleague, Tim. Thank you. Uh, Tim Sinclair, I'm a county councillor uh, covering Stratford North. My question actually links very much into Susan Junids. Um, we heard about from Margot James, the vision being that, that, that we should be the home of green innovation. Our home isn't our home. It's 
million people, hundreds of thousands of people's homes. How do we inspire them? You've all talked about it, that we need to get everybody involved. How do we inspire them all and how do we mobilise them to do something that makes a difference? Thank you very much. We, um, uh, this is going to be quite a challenge, so um, I'm going to probably pick and mix a little bit on, on this. But the first one, um, I would suggest that we look at Nuneaton perhaps first and Coventry. Um, uh, so, and then there's something about a central pot of money, which we might all like to think about. There's something about how do we city and some of our districts uh, look at um, kind of joining up the uh, issues about um, emissions. Can I go to you first then? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, c clearly some of these decisions are, are political in nature and obviously I'm not a politician, so I, I can't make pledges <coughs> there about how, how things might be. I think it is around that, that, that communication and being open to collaboration ideas. Um, so by all means, you know, as, as ideas come forward in an organisation, they, they will be considered. But I, I couldn't stand here today and say, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll commit to a central part and we'll, we'll put into it. Um, but certainly, you know, we're open to, to hearing different, different views and different ideas. I think one of the points I want to just touch upon, which, which is quite well made, I think, is around how you resonate with the people and how you deliver um, what you say you're going to do. And I think for us <coughs> at Nuneaton and Bedworth, it's around being really honest about what we are going to do and not make pledges that we aren't going to deliver on. Um, you know, let, let's make sure what we do what we say we're going to do is what we are going to do and you know, use, use our decision-making opportunities as they present to make the changes that we, we, we can make and, and, and celebrate things when they're done well, but not over-pledge and recognise you know, our unique position and what we, what we can achieve. And I think in relation to, to, to people, it's around making it tangible. You know, the, the Ukrainian crisis is driving up uh, fuel prices. More and more, you know, people will start to think about how they're going to heat their homes, how they're going to pay to, to drive and, 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 and travel to work. And I think that's, that's one of the same problem in many ways. So it's around actually, you know, some people won't connect with biodiversity, some people won't connect with, you know, the, the gross amount of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere, but they will commit with paying the utility bills. So it is around tangibility, I think, for, for people. Fantastic. Um, right, uh, do you like to talk on the issues about emissions? Yeah, I think the, one of the key things where I think there's going to be a big impact. You, got, you might have to come. So you haven't yeah. come here, do you? Yeah. Um, one of the, the big areas, I think, for collaboration, one of the biggest issues that, that we're all facing as authorities is actual data, quality data that tells us what impact we have. So we can invest in things, but we actually don't, if we don't know the outcome of it or the results, that's going to be really significant. Um, it's an issue we've raised with Westminster Combined Authority, and I know some of our colleagues in, in other authorities as well. Um, we're, we're part of a, a programme in the UK at the moment, working with Climate View, which is a Swedish-based organisation that's been backed by the Swedish government and has been working with cities in Sweden and in Germany. Um, and they're now working with us. We've got five authorities. It's, uh, um, Coventry's one of them, along with Newcastle. Um, Nottingham um, has got some involvement and engagement in this as well, and, and Dundee in, in Scotland and Cambridge. Um, and it's been really, really difficult. Um, a lot of the data that we're using, a lot of the data you see is two years old, coming from Bayes, um, and yet we're going to make investment decisions, so we need to have quality data. So that's one thing where collaborative approaches could work. Um, we're trying at the moment within Climate View. We're focusing on the transport side. Newcastle's focusing around buildings. We've got Dundee doing some other work on, on areas around their fleet uses and fleet services. Trying to find ways in which we can gather data that's reliable, that we can report year on year. When you talk about community engagement, one way of engaging people, and we like the model of Seattle years ago set up a state of a city report and that's one of our intentions in Coventry is to do that is to actually produce a report every year that gives people an ongoing recognition of what's happening and the thing with climate view is focusing on incremental steps so what happens if someone gets out of their car and rides a bike what does that result in terms on average in a city in terms of carbon reduction if we can work that out and we can model what and predict what the likely outcomes will be, we're in a much better position to make investment decisions. So in terms of resources, 
things like retrofit and um, big issue. Our chief executive Coventry has met with the chief executive Wolverhampton and Birmingham are looking at this issue about the government that gives us grants to do this, they will take us forever to do. So to give you an example, we've, we've been successful in every single bidding round in Coventry for retrofit. And that has basically, in effect, retrofitted 600 houses. To put that into perspective, we have over 13,000 properties that are actually suffering from fuel poverty that are below category C. That's just, that's families that can't afford it. Then we've got a similar number elsewhere. So where do we get this resource? If the government grant only allows us to do 600 a year, we need to have that issue. So this is where collaborative thinking around how to get financial institutions to back that and make it economic. And that, I think, is one of the biggest challenges, is how we do that. Thank you, Brett. That's great. Um, I wanted to touch on Susan's um, about the frustration and communities and uh, communications uh, that you talked about. Um, and I wonder if I might invite um, Ian, would you like to come in on, on that, Ian and Alan? Yeah. yeah. Got I'll go time. first. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I spoke earlier on about, uh, if you like, involving parish councils and town councils, and I'm very much a, a believer, I'll stand up because I'm only small anyway, so you can't see me at the back. Um, so I spoke about parish councils and town councils uh, and, and having a using funding to train uh, parish champions. One of the problems for people, uh, for residents, is the, they see all the big ticket items and all the, the expense that goes with heat pumps, with insulation and this sort of thing. And their prime concern right at this moment for a lot of residents is heat or eat. Terrible phrase, but heat or eat. And that's a big problem. How do you get around that? The other problem, obviously, Ukraine, the big problem, Ukraine and possibly war in Europe. People are more worried about these sort of things. Climate change has slipped down the, pro, down the, down the scale a little bit. So my feeling is that we have to get out into those parishes and towns. <coughs> we have to get parish champions out there. We have to keep it simple. Let's do the simple stuff first. And the simple stuff, as I mentioned earlier on, is things like... When, what do I put in each of my bins? How do I recycle more effectively? Getting people out of their cars is, 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 a great, is great. However, in, in say Stratford, a very rural area, that is not realistic to get people out of the cars on day one. So let's do the simple stuff, get the momentum going first, and then as, as prices come down, hopefully, on electric vehicles and as the infrastructure is built, we can then move people steadily along that path. I think it's unrealistic to say that it will all happen straight away. We have to start with the simple stuff first. Get people on board, show them how to recycle, how to... In Stratford, we're moving to a 123 plus system. And so from August, uh, the residual waste will only be collected every three weeks, not every two weeks. And we see in the bins, um, the analysis shows that up to 30% of what's in the current bin should be in the blue bin or the green bin. It should be recycled <coughs> one way or another. So there's eminently, there's a lot more we can do along that path. And that starts to build up momentum. We can get kids involved in this. And that starts to build up a momentum then. And that's my, the, where I feel we can make a difference at community level. And I'll stop there because I can that, see that's, that's great. And, and Tim, you talked about how do we inspire people. And in a way, that goes to the point that many of our speakers have talked about taking people with us. And invariably, people will have different paces. So, uh, so the next question is picking up that how do we inspire. Emma, I can see you want to come in on that. And maybe Heather, I'll bring you in after that yeah. if we can be quick yeah no I mean I think on bringing people along with us I mean for me I think I think at rugby we're, we're trying to lead by example and I think in order to keep up that momentum it's 
It's about embedding everything in all the decisions that the council makes and then communicating that to people. And you know, the point I raised about when we did the survey is so many people just still don't know enough about this. So by taking actions within the council and influencing the things that we can actually influence and communicating that to people, then hopefully that will start to make a difference. And just, you know, the things about the retrofitting, for example, I mean, we are doing some retrofitting work at the moment, and we've had some issues with some of our tenants saying that they're not sure if they want to have a heat pump. <laughs> so we're actually going in there to talk to them about it. And I think it is about going down right down to that grassroots level and just explaining to people the, the benefits of doing all these things as well because I think there are so many benefits that can come and when we explain that to people and they understand how it can make a difference to their lives then hopefully things will start to change but I think from a council perspective we have to start with our own governance and embed everything there and communicate it out to people. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And on this one, the last one's going to be Heather, and then I'm going to take some more questions, and I'll bring in those who haven't spoken on those. Heather. Yes, thanks, Susie. Um, very much, I, um, the community grants, the Green Shoots Fund, was all about this, so that we had projects that were on the ground that people could see, touch, feel, know the benefits of, and being able to communicate, constantly communicate that out um, to residents. So that, that was a key aim with that, that fund and that's what we will continue to do to make sure there are tangible things to be able to refer to and communicate the benefits of those. That's, that's going to be the real key, I think, of getting people on board. Parish and town councils, we have a, 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 a Warwickshire County Council have a reference group for parish, parish and town councils, which we regularly meet. If one of the benefits of technology is absolutely that we can meet uh, as, a, as a county now, uh, on Zoom or whatever, and we can get the messages across in a one-to-one -one way um, and talk to people about climate change and transport and all of those big issues that previously probably landed on their desk as a huge tome of, of a strategy or a policy or a, a fancy printed document. Now we're talking to them. Now we're talking to those people directly. And I think that's really key as well. To be able to do that is, is great. Brilliant. I love my fellow councillors to pieces, but sometimes we do forget that this is your moment. Mm -hmm. So back to your moment. Um, I've got a gentleman who popped his hand up there and another gentleman here. Jonathan, uh, and, oh, okay, go. Afternoon. Um, what we've seen in, in other regions of the UK, London, um, some Scotland, Birmingham in particular, um, is a setting of higher standards in planning guidance locally. I just wonder whether the panel wanted to discuss how that might be done regionally rather than individually. That's a very good question, and I know just the man for that one in a minute. So shall we take Jonathan here? Um, please, and then I think I'm just going to take those two questions, Jonathan. Hello, Jonathan Chilvers, uh, councillor in Levington. Um, question about um, transport. A number of speakers mentioned the, the emissions coming out of uh, transport. And it just strikes me there's still quite a deeply ingrained sort of attitude that when we to get economic prosperity and housing growth, we still need to build more roads um, at, at kind of vast carbon emissions and a lot of the government funding is still angled in that direction. So my question is, how do we turn that oil tanker around um, and change the attitude? I, well, I'm going to change my mind. The gentleman immediately behind you, if we can be quick and then we'll pick those up. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Andrew Gabitas. I'm chair of Warwickshire Community and Voluntary Action and also a, a trustee of the Wildlife Trust. I'm just interested perhaps taking a fly on the wall view of what's happened so far, exaggerate for effect, but somebody might think that biodiversity was just tree planting. I'd rather suggest it's more complex than that. And we talked, I hear you all talk about industry. No specific mentions of agriculture, and far and away it must be the biggest use of land in Warwickshire. Um, and Farmers have got to make a living, they've got to run a business, and we've all got to eat. So how do we deal with squaring those circles of 
getting some real action on climate change through the way we do agriculture. Lovely. Thank you. And that you, you guys have got to be fairly quick. Um, so I'm going to go to Alan, and I'm then going to go to Dave. We've got housing, transport, and agriculture. And biodiversity comes in that. So. Well, on the housing, I, I just repeat what I said in, in our presentation. Warwick District Council has produced a, a development planning document, which is currently out of consultation, which if it passes examination in public, will ensure that all new buildings will be totally sustainable. Unfortunately, we've had to do that because the government is being very slow in its, in its uh, changing of the planning rules and the, and the building regulations. So hopefully by, we think, late this year or early next year, we will have a DPD in place to make sure that all new housing is as far as can be sustainable and net zero. Brilliant, thank you. Dave, have you got thoughts yeah, on well, <clears throat> When it comes to planning and housing, uh, a lot of it's led, it's like you've said earlier, the same-o, same-o. But that's what people want at the moment. We've got big changes. You can look at the, has, the past housing, <clears throat> tiny windows, heat pumps, different heating. I have got a friend who's just in, put a heat pump in and it's very good because it brings the temperature up about seven degrees lower than you really need it. So then it sort of supplements what's there. So some of that technology is not right yet. I went to, to a meeting with Anne Cluid once who wanted all new houses to have sprinklers. And a big campaign to do it from the fire brigade, etc. never happened. It's not local authority that's going to change what's needed in terms of housing recommendations. It's what the people want and the government that's going to put it in. So we need to actually get people to change their minds how they want to do it. Otherwise it's going to be three bedrooms upstairs, two bathrooms, toilet, etc. and it won't, it, it won't change. Uh, so I don't see in terms of the, uh, the county being able to change things that it matters. When we spoke about uh, housing, uh, sorry, development earlier and agriculture, not far from me, the one curse of being in North Warwickshire it's got three exits off the motorway along the M42. One's just outside North Warwickshire. It's a target for every single developer. I can name St Modwins, Prologis, IM Properties. They focus on those places. A local farmer up there just sold 289 hectares. And he wanted to get out of the business. He wasn't interested. Right next to a special scientific, you know, triple SI, right next to where the farm was, it's now and I'm probably going to say the wrong thing in this building, <laughs> like it's struck by lightning. Jaguar Land Rover wanted a factory, and get what? Jaguar, Jaguar Land Rover have ended up with two and a half million square feet of buildings on that particular site. So it's what's driving the economy that's going to do it, not necessarily what the county could do. And you can have green views. And then I could move down to Junction 10. We've got Hodgetts that want to build another four million square feet. Mm. And then go down to Junction 9, Iron property has been very greedy. You want to put another three million square feet. It is a problem for the growth. You want the growth. We want the work. It brings the houses, but it also brings the destruction of uh, agriculture, uh, etc. So I'm not sure what the answer is. If I did know the answer, I'd probably be running a government. Thank you. And, and arguably, Andrew, you know, along with the reduction of um, land, we get biodiversity loss as well. So really big thorny issues and I know every one of these would like to talk more um, and I'm afraid I'm going to steal them at their time and their moment but can I encourage you to speak to them it, through lunch, that might mean you won't get any lunch but um, you know this is quite important. I've got a few key things that I want to talk about and I have to say farming is one of those issues I'm going to pick up that point Andrew and um, the reason we have got the base of the NFU sitting here and if we, as a council, as an area, do not value the need for farming, and particularly uh, when we, everything seems to be going, going back to the war in Ukraine at the moment, particularly when we think about food um, security and all of that right now, ensuring that we can feed our population with confidence that, you know, these are important issues that need to be thought about alongside how we're doing it, 
and whether we're, we're, uh, we could do it in a different way to not make that impact that we might have done otherwise. And I think housing is one of those key points, Alan, which uh, you've brought up uh, quite rightly, that we need to uh, be thinking, putting our collective heads together about the type of housing we can build, whether uh, the laws that nationally um, constrain us uh, if there is influence or indeed a local way that we can try and make changes that, that will future-proof ourselves. So, uh, but what I do wanted to thank all my panellists today for their input. Um, I want to suggest that you uh, actually remember that collectively we have ambition here and, and we'll work together to deliver for you. Oops for all of you and for our residents. And, and that collective voice coming together is something that perhaps after today we might get more momentum behind. Um, what the, there is one really, really fun thing that we have to do today. So uh, this is our young green shoots. Um, and just to put a bit of context behind that, earlier this year, we in Warwickshire County Council launched a competition for children and young people, and this was across our region to tell us what being a climate hero meant to them. Uh, we had over 200 entries, so that was very exciting in itself. And some were pictures, some were pieces of writing, and there was even one which was a sculpture. So uh, a really delightful, um, thought-provoking way forward. And I want to thank those of you who are here who helped us with the very difficult job of judging this so in particular ed green who's uh, from warwickshire wildlife trust david mond from warwickshire climate alliance um, and both i think are with us today but we also had uh and i'm going to get this wrong uh laika iqbal from the warwickshire youth council who helped on that so we have four winners and each of them have won £2,500 of funding from Warwickshire County Council Green Shoots Fund and the Community Fund for their school. And that's to spend on projects which will relate to fighting climate change. So it gives a legacy to continue that thought process and, and to keep our younger people talking about climate change and how they might come forward with ideas. We don't all have them in this room. Um, so, uh, the impact on the community, uh, we want that impact on community action that we can see uh, that comes from young people, and we've heard a bit today. And we're excited to see what they're going to do with that. So, in the meantime, you can see all the entries. No, you can't. Can we see all the entries? I can see someone clicking, a clicker. The, all the entries. Uh, um, from the winners and the runners-up will be displayed in the room next door and please do have a look at it because this is what young people can come forward with. Um, we haven't got, we, can we not get the slide up? No, it's all going to be in there. Okay, so just by way of a reminder because it is lunchtime and I'm keeping you from it. Uh, when we get back after lunch, which will be by way of a reminder, at two o'clock-ish. We are going to have go back to the breakout sessions. We're not going to come in here. Um, there's going to be a slide up which will say where those breakout sessions will be. So take your choice and decide where you're going to go and then find the room for that. Is that okay? Is there anything else that I need to say? No? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your questions. I know you've got hundreds more. Thank you for your answers and for your thoughts. And let's go and do lunch and more questions. Thank you. <laughs>